Well, it is, it is really good to be with you all, <laughs> okay? And uh, you notice the uh, you all there is, uh, no, I've just been influenced by Texas. I'm not from there. Grand Junction, Colorado is our home base. And um, so that's a wonderful spot to be able to come visit. And we encourage people to do that and uh, come see what it's like. We have some of the amazing red rock sandstone uh, cliffs, the canyons, the all those formations. If anybody's been at Garden of the Gods, this is like Garden of Gods, but um, 20 miles of it, <laughs> okay, or more than that. So, yeah, we're going to be talking, and I do want to share the screen. All right, so anyhow, you can write down our website. You can get information on our website about our tours, okay? Uh, Yellowstone tours and also Costa Rica trip tours. And when I was here last time, I gave you a creationist tour of uh, Yellowstone National Park or of Costa Rica. So we're going to do a creation tour of Yellowstone National Park this evening. So anyhow, in the whole thing, we want to lay the foundation here. The foundation of what we do is based on Genesis 1 through 11, correct? When we have to look at the beauty, we look at the design we're going to be talking about tonight and that's in the, from the creation isn't it okay that's from the actual creation but we can't lose sight of the fact that there's also a fall you can talk about design but you really can't talk about design without somebody said but what about grizzly bears all right and uh and chewing on your toes when you're camping in a tent right so, I mean, that doesn't sound like design, but you have to understand there's a thing called the fall. All right. So where sin, death, et cetera, entered into the world. But even at Yellowstone, you have evidence for the flood and the uh, destruction at the time when God said enough is enough is enough. And I kind of wonder when he's going to say that today. All right. And then we have the people groups dispersing after the uh, languages are confused at the Tower of Babel. We're going to look at the uh, biblical timeline there, Genesis 1 through 11, which basically takes the first one-fourth of that line, okay? All right, Genesis 1 through 11. And, uh, but we're going to also ask where on that timeline from creation, the fall, the flood, Babel, to the cross to now, where on that timeline do you fit in the uh, volcanics that occurred at Yellowstone National Park? And where do the ice ages fit in? So hopefully we're going to be able to tell you that here yet today, okay? And so uh, keep in mind that when we also look at God creating things, he created it not in vain he formed it to be inhabited keep that in mind we're going to be talking about that informed it to be inhabited and we do see that even the deserts today are inhabited by a lot of creatures okay we see thorns and thistles but look at the beautiful flowers and those beautiful cactus Gorgeous, gorgeous flowers on those cacti. And so you say, even in the midst of destruction and the thorns and thistles of the fall, you see God made beauty out of destruction. And we're going to see beauty out of destruction when we look at the Yellowstone National Park. Okay? We're going to be looking at all that. How does that fit in? How does the Ice Age fit in with the flood, etc.? And uh, when we go to Yellowstone National Park, you're going to find out there used to be ice covering Yellowstone National Park uh, to a depth of 4,000 feet. It's a lot of ice. You had a lot of ice uh, here in Minnesota, too, almost every winter. <laughs> <laughs> well, it's not quite that cold here, but <laughs> uh, anyhow. But you know that water from that ice, I want you to think about it. After you have a flood, the whole world's covered by water. According to Psalm 104, the mountains rise up, the valleys sink down. Correct? So far, we're good? All right. So uh, where did all the water go for the flood? Well, it didn't have to go anywhere. The mountains rose up out of it. 
and the valleys sank down. So we're looking at even Mariana's Trench, and that's way, way deep. And uh, what's being circulated around here is our, our publication Think and before the sign-up sheet or print-up sheet, I should say, for a publication Think and Believe. It comes out once every couple of months or every two months, pretty regularly. And um, you can uh, get the latest of what we're finding out on the science and also some great stories along with it. Okay, so we have fun with it. But think about it now, we have the flood, whole world covered by water, mountains are rising up. We have Marianne, Marianas Trench that's about seven miles deep in the ocean. All right, so uh, you say, where did that water go? Well, if you flatten out the earth, you flatten out the earth, make it look like a soccer ball, you have enough water to cover the entire wor world, even when it's everything smoothed out, by about 8,000 feet of water. So there's plenty of water, even on the planet Earth right now, uh, just in the surface ocean to cover and make a flood. But now as mountains are coming up, valleys are sinking down, um, hmm, so now water goes into the Marianas Trench. That takes care of part of that. After that flood, you have what's called the um, Ice Age. And when you have 4,000 feet of ice here, in other places in the world, you have 10,000 feet deep of ice. It's a lot of ice, okay? Um, then there's a lot of that ocean that's going to be on the surface of the Earth on, in ice sheets, okay? That means ocean levels, believe it or not, shortly after the flood, were lower than they are today. In which case, there are huge land bridges, hundreds of miles wide, that for the animal distribution to go all over the face of the earth. So far, so good? All right. Now, um, and then as the uh, uh, ice is melting, there's got a lot of big lakes that form as well. And uh, those big lakes now also lower that sea level and keep it low. Uh, and eventually those land bridges, and people migration, et cetera, all over the face of the earth. Well, the biblical timeline, uh, where, do the, where does volcanism fit in? How about uh, Ice Age? We're going to get into it. Yellowstone, here we come. You ready? You've gotten the background. So here we go. What caused Yellowstone? It is a gorgeous spot. You can see from those pictures, right? And in fact, it's still steaming. That means there's heat involved. All right, there, there's plenty of heat involved with that. And aha, uh -huh. now we can see you guys. <laughs> Instead of trying to look over like this, a lot of heat involved. Well, in geology, we have two different uh, ideas. One is uniformitarianism. The other one is catastrophism. Uniformitarianism says, well, everything goes along at a roughly the same intensity over millions of years. It's the same now as it was in the past. Okay. Catastrophism says, no, Earth history is punctuated by major catastrophes, major changes that's out of the ordinary. All right. And so when you think about those two particular ideas, uh, think about, uh, how about a volcano here? Think about a volcano. Is that catastrophic? But it's actually part of the uniformitarian geologic model too. They recognize the occasional volcano. All right, they do. So they incorporate volcanism even in the, in the uh, uniformitarian model. Of course, we look at it and we say, uh, hmm, Volcanism is catastrophic. Well, not as much as it was in the past. Past volcanism is fit catastrophism, and you'll understand why here in a little while. But modern volcanism is part of uniformitarianism. So, okay, plate tectonics. You've all heard about that. Continental drift, etc. Well, this is a place that you can really see the effects of the continental uh, and plates moving. And because focused around Costa Rica just happens to be um, a couple of different plates and they're moving and that's pushing things around. They're being subducted, some of it. Subducted means 
pushed under another type of a mass, for instance, the oceanic crust being pushed or subducted underneath the uh, continental mass, okay? So we see that. So when you have something like that going down that generates heat, things come up, and that's where you're going to have a lot of the catastrophism, okay? Or the volcanic activity. You look in Costa Rica, there's probably seven active volcanoes there in a country that's only as big as one third the state of Minnesota, okay? And so uh, a lot of uh, volcanoes going off there, a wonderful place to visit. All right, a good place to visit. And, uh, but now that is still part of the uniformitarian geology. Now, when we get to catastrophic geology, a catastrophism, we look at maybe what caused the Noahic flood. And instead of one plate gradually going down underneath the continental plate, causing some volcanism here and there, we have all of a sudden a lot more velocity of those plates coming down. When you speed up that oceanic crust just a little bit, being subducted a little faster, it produces extra heat into the mantle. That makes the mantle easier to have something come down through. So now the oceanic plate goes faster. It generates more heat, goes faster. And like a conveyor belt, all of a sudden, all of the, uh, the oceanic plate is subducted or carried underneath the, ocean, the uh, continental plate. Now, what that does is leave something in the center, which drawn here, Mid-Atlantic Spreading Ridge. There's going to be a lot of brand new soft material coming up new soft hot material it's not yet cooled so you're going to have a lot of uh you might say geysers coming up a lot of vents a lot of steam uh, a lot of water in the atmosphere and then also it turns out that fresh volcanic deposits are not as dense as the old ones they're they're lighter so because they're lighter, the mantle can push up a little bit more on it. And what that does is cause the oceans to rise. The calculations by Dr. John Baumgartner says that could cause the oceans to rise as much as 6,000 feet. What's that going to do to us in Minnesota right here if uh, the ocean levels were 6,000 feet deeper? Yeah. How long can you tread water, in other words? And a good share of the earth will be uh, probably inundated, except the highest uh, places. And I don't believe the mountains were as high before the flood as they are today. If we see in the Psalms in the World War, the mountains rose up, the valley sank down. Okay, so that would be enough right there to be able to flood the earth. We also hear that the windows of heaven were opened. Okay, but that's all was probably, according to John Baumgarter's model, <clears throat> all resulting in the flood of Noah's day, all resulting in the split up of the continents, etc. If you want to know more about that, look up the word runaway subduction on our website at discovercreation.org. Go right into our website, look up runaway subduction, and there's an article and that picture will come up for you. Okay, and uh, that was a very good uh, model for the flood. Now, so what you have, if this happened, you have leftovers of this kind of tectonic movement, and then you have hot spots. Boy, that sounds really good. Sometimes in a cold winter day in Minnesota, right? There are hot spots, but there are great big hot spots. And those particular hot spots are right now still under Yellowstone National Park. And that's what's going to give you all of the part of the, uh, uh, or virtually all of the thermal features that you find in Yellowstone that we're going to be looking at. But that hot spot 
you might say has moved. And you see the different circles, kind of all the way from Oregon to uh, Yellowstone today, all the different, and of course the numbers there supposedly represent how many millions of years ago that was. Doesn't have to be that way, okay? It just shows you the movement. But it isn't necessarily the hot spot that's moving. It's the, still the drifting of the continent over the top of the hot spot. Okay? Now, if that trend, if it would continue the same, living just to the nor, uh, upper right of there would not be a good spot to live. You see the trend? So Red Lodge, Montana, not a good spot to buy real estate, <laughs> okay? But I'm gonna say at the end of this program that it may not be that bad, okay? Now, first of all, you understand that this particular hotspot caused some major eruptions, major ones, compared to what we have today. How many remember Mount St. Helens? Wasn't that a monstrous volcanic eruption, right? That's what we all thought, but it is no more than a little tiny pop gun compared to some of the volcanic blasts coming from what's called the Yellowstone hotspot. Just a little tiny pop gun. You see that uh, the square down on the bottom on the right? That's the Mount St. Helens. That's a material that was expelled out of Mount St. Helens. But wait a minute, uh, wait a minute. Look at those that were actually expelled out of the volcanic eruptions at Yellowstone National Park. Look at the big blue box and the other two preceding it. We have approximately 4,000 times larger eruptions at Yellowstone than what we had at Mount St. Helens. That's a bunch, all right? And then there was actually one more, even bigger than the Huckleberry Ridge, making the whole thing roughly 10,000 times the amount of material expelled at Mount St. Helens, 10,000, that's a bunch. Okay, so we understand the size of the Yellowstone blast, right? It was big. Uh, the only place you wanna observe that from is from the space shuttle somewhere. Okay, or yeah, right. Uh, but you don't wanna be anywhere near that. Even in Minnesota, you probably wouldn't be safe, okay? Well, what happens when we have all of that stuff exploded out of this big volcanic eruption? What happens? You got a hole on the ground, right? And you have a hole in the ground, you still have a bunch of material coming up and giving you lava flows throughout the Yellowstone region. And pretty soon they still have the hole underneath. And then it now eventually collapses, giving you what's called a crater, okay? And that's called a collapsed caldera, like a crater, of Yellowstone National Park. And it's in this collapsed caldera that most all of the features of Yellowstone that do, we like to go visit are found. Not all of them, there are others as well, but that's where the bulk of it is. At Yellowstone National Park, this particular caldera called the Yellowstone, the most recent one that we have, is uh, basically 35 miles by 45 miles. Is that a lot of miles? Isn't that a pretty good size hole in the ground? Yes, it is, okay. And uh, we still have the hot spot underneath there, don't we? And that hot spot, because of all the cracks there, the water finds its way down, percolates around, and you get uh, the hydrothermal features of Yellowstone National Park. And there are over 10,000 hydrothermal features in Yellowstone, all right? Yellowstone Park is approximately uh, just a little under 3,500 square miles of national park. It's a big one, right? That's a big national park. Uh, we, at Yellowstone, there are half of the world's hydrothermal features of the world's and over 300 geysers. And we're gonna talk about what those things are, geysers. That's when water and steam, but especially water, get 
explode up into the air. All right. That's what does it. And then we have hot springs where you don't have the explosive action. You might have fumaroles. It's just smoking. That's all. Steam. And then mud pots. And that's, uh, that's another one as well. The mud pots are like the hot springs, actually. Okay. All right. So how does a geyser work? Just to give you a little background there. What happens? You have a hot spot underneath. It's very deep underneath Yellowstone. And then the water from uh, snow melt, et cetera, groundwater, find its way down into the cracks. Because if you have a collapsed caldera, there's a lot of cracks in that thing, right? Yeah, there are a lot of cracks. And then what happens then, the water circulates down into those cracks. And it doesn't come out immediately as a geyser or whatever. Now, what happens is the water comes down. Now you have a column of water way down to the bottom. The water is starting to boil. Okay, you got that? And the pressure is there because a geyser has a constricted neck. It's harder for the water to get out. It's constricted. And eventually that water at the bottom that's getting, getting heated up, it's hot enough, it's boiling. Now it turns from liquid water into steam. Steam occupies a volume of 100 times the volume of the water it came from. That all of a sudden gives you what? A huge volume displacement pushes on up, pushes the water column up, and pretty soon it pushes enough up, it now can blow out. And so you have what's called good old, eight old faithful geyser, okay? Now, if you don't have it constricted as much, you may only have a hot spring, okay? It won't be the explosive force that would produce those geysers, all right? So you have an uh, old faithful geyser that goes off about every 90 minutes, plus or minus 10 minutes. So that that's uh, a good one. Everybody going to Yellowstone wants to go see Old Faithful, right? Everybody does. Maybe even see it two or three times. And um, I have plenty of pictures of Old Faithful. <laughs> I like some of the other geysers, okay? I like like Castle Geyser, etc. cetera. Um, it's prettier. <laughs> uh, maybe not the volume of water that you might find at Old Faithful, but uh, it's still beautiful geysers. Or the fishing cone geyser. That one's not erupting right now. But when the uh, lake is a little bit higher, um, it's kind of a drought this last year, then that is covered with water. Mm -hmm. And the old, the, uh, old timers talked about the times where they actually would fish around there for Yellowstone cutthroat trout. They would fish. And uh, the first person who mentioned it was an old trapper and way back a couple centuries ago. And uh, I think it was Bridger, all right, but an old trapper. And uh, he reported having caught fish, dragged it over the hot geyser spring, Got it cooked, and he was ready to eat it on shore when he got it in. But you know what? Everybody thought, yeah, this is just a crazy, drunken <laughs> mountain man here, right? It turns out, many, many, many years later, they were actually doing that. They were actually doing it, cooking their fish, partly. All right, so some of the geysers are really beautiful. Some of them kind of look like hot, they're hot pools until they blow off the steam, right? And the water comes up, and the rose column comes out of there. Art Artemisia is that one right there. And so, uh, so we're looking at now going from geysers over to hot springs. And some of the beautiful hot springs you see, like for instance, the Grand Prismatic, uh, it's in the Midway Geyser Basin. Isn't that a gorgeous pool? Just absolutely gorgeous. If, if I'm sure the picture is taken on a warm summer afternoon. I didn't take this particular one, 
most of these or many of them I did in this presentation. But when you look at that one, I know that it was in a very warm summer. Otherwise, if it's a little cool, it's all steam. All you see are steam sometimes, okay? And so uh, this last August, we had plenty of steam, but it was plenty clear. And uh, there, look at that. Look at the gorgeous colors of that, okay? Of Grand Prismatic Hot Spring. And uh, people say, well, maybe hot pools, hot, oh, and water. Maybe that's where life evolved. Maybe in something like Grand Prismatic, okay? <clears throat> well, they've been trying to show how the life originated without God for a long period of time. All right. I like this particular quote here. It's Franklin M. Harold. Uh, said in 2001, first of all, he said this, we should reject as a matter of principle, the substitution of intelligent design for the dialogue of natural selection, survival of the fittest, right? Or what he says, chance and necessity. But listen to what he just said in the very next breath. We must concede that there are presently no detailed Darwinian accounts of the evolution of any biochemical or cellular systems, only a variety of wishful speculations. He knows that. He acknowledges it. But he said, no way, we're not going to go toward intelligent design. That means there was a designer. Can't have that right? Because of his worldview. His worldview is that of naturalism. Everything can and must be explained only by strictly naturalistic processes without a God. You with me? That's what he says. All right. So, uh, but when you look at some of these pools there, you can actually uh, look at the abyss pool. You can look at the sapphire pool. I love watching those pools. But you don't want to try to bring your swimming suit. First of all, it's illegal. Second, you won't have any skin left. <laughs> all right? Just not a good idea. A lot of the material around that particular pool, you see the white that is actually a siliceous uh, center is what it's called. It's made of silicon dioxide, which is quartz. Okay? That's quartz. And um, sometimes the hot pools shift a little bit. They actually shift into the forest. And when that happens, it kills the trees. And in fact, you see those white bobby socks? In the 50s, they used to call them bobby socks. Okay, that's what they did. Everybody wanted to wear bobby socks, <laughs> all right? But there are the white bottoms of those trees. That means they suck this silica material up into their roots. And then now it's down there, it's silicified, or you might say petrified, okay? Petrified. And uh, that kills the rest of the tree. And now they're standing upright like that. So that's kind of an interesting one right there, bobby sock trees. All right, so we've been talking about geysers. We've talked about hot springs. The next one is fumaroles. You might see in an airport, no smoking. Kind of fumarole, right? All the, whether what language you're in, even in Spanish, they call them fumaroles, okay? We have what's called Roaring Mountain over there in Yellowstone. Look at all those vents. On a cold day, it would be all steam over there. It's called Roaring Mountain because in the uh, 1890s, when they were actually exploring a lot of this region, people would be able to hear those things roar from miles away. And they're just steam, steam exploding and that sort of stuff. And so that was called Roaring Mountain is what the name they gave to it. All right. So that's uh, steaming. That's the water isn't necessary. Just pipe it out. That's all steam. All right, now we have mud pots. There's some of the mud pots right there. It is very similar to the hot spring, except there's not enough water coming up to be able to clean out the hot spring. So it just turns into mud, okay? 
So those are the mud spots. You see the mud volcano in the early part of 1900. The, uh, they were talking about mud volcano, which is pretty placid these days, but they were that mud would be swung up into the air like a geyser, a geyser of mud. Okay, up in there, you coat the trees all around it. I wasn't there back then, but that's what the old timers say. Okay, mud volcano from a mud pot. All right, now, so we looked at the four main thermal features, correct? Um, now we also have a further north in Yellowstone, what's called Mammoth Hot Springs. And there we have hot water coming through as well, but it's different, it's a different chemical composition in general. And what you are looking at are terraces of limestone. And what happens is the water is coming through an area that is rich in limestone. It dissolves the calcium carbonate, and now it comes finally comes out where it can be released. The pressure drops, pH changes, and you have precipitation of calcium carbonate. So it was limestone, calcium carbonate. Now it is again. So we call that reconstituted limestone. It's like flowstone and stalactites and stalagmites. They're all that same type, even in cave deposits of reconstituted stuff. And so uh, that's what we see at Mammoth. It is an amazing uh, place to go visit. Uh, some people's favorites. All right. So reconstituted limestone, the whole town of Mammoth uh, there in the Yellowstone, the town of Mammoth, which is an old army base, is, ba is built upon terraces, old limestone terraces. All right, when you go on up there, it's just amazing to look at some of the features now that we just talked about the different ones, okay? Uh, Excelsior Geyser was a monstrous geyser at one time. It blew itself out, okay? It literally blew itself out and uh, probably would not have been a good time to standing there to be standing there watching it, okay? But right now it's a hot spring. It's uh, the crater of Excelsior uh, uh, Geyser. But that has so much water coming out of it. There's 4,000 gallons per minute coming out of that. That's a lot of water. Okay, and it's going into what's called the Firehole River. So you have hot water coming into the Firehole River. Upstream a little bit, you have Old Faithful and a whole bunch of other things pumping water into the Firehole River. Now, why do you think they call it Firehole River? Hot, because of the hot water. Now, there's a lot of cold water in there too, and people used to. Uh, take their swimming suits when it was still legal, and they would find a spot that was just the right temperature, okay? And they would be swimming and soaking in that. Uh, now, but I want to point out one other thing. You see those stripes just above that? Yeah, yeah, I've kind of greenish, some yellow, some browns, right? We're going to talk about that, but keep in mind, those things are strands of what are called thermophiles, Thermophiles, hmm, actually those are tremendous colonies of microorganisms, okay, microorganisms. And you see the wonderful colors there of Grand Prismatic. All the different colors are produced by different organisms that are thermophiles, that means heat Loving, okay, city of Philadelphia, all right, city of love, whatever. But anyhow, we've got um, 198 degrees. You can pretty much, get, that'll give you pretty much an azure blue. And that is pretty much the lack of some of those thermophiles there and the reflection out of the atmosphere. I think it has something to do with some of the chemicals that are going on in there too, but uh, if it's only 147 degrees, then you have yellow thermophiles, a specific range, a specific type. 
and all the way down to 110 is brown. If it's green, it's about 95, okay? Nice temperature, somewhere between 95 and 110. And so, but you can't legally swim there, okay? Uh, huh. But you don't want to tip, put your toe in the blue water. <laughs> you just don't. That is hot. All right, now, this has been a problem for evolution for a while. And the reason for it is because you have these thermophiles at Yellowstone National Park. And the, say, the yellow band there, et cetera, it can only live in a narrow temperature range band. If it gets a little colder, then that thermophile dies off. If it gets a little hotter, it dies off. But you go across the world, you know what you find? Same color thermophiles in hot springs. And you say, how did they get there? Certainly, uh, that temperature wasn't 100 and say uh, 47 degrees all the way from Yellowstone clear over to uh, New Zealand, correct? How did that happen? Remember, God fills his niches, doesn't he? He has all these different type of environments. He has filled those environments with his creation. That's the only thing I can think of. In fact, there was one... Uh, Gentleman who was a creationist, ended up going to university, who was hammered with evolution, became an evolutionist and an atheist for a while. Then he started studying the thermophiles in Yellowstone National Park. And that's what drove him back to realizing there has to be a God that created it. Okay. And uh, anyhow, but then he also studied some other things. There are things called extremophiles. Some of these things live in so hot a water, it's like 600 degree, 660 degrees Fahrenheit. That's really hot, isn't it? But it's way deep coming out of the black smokers, say, in the bottom of the ocean. Those are extremophiles, extreme loving temperatures, extreme conditions. I like this little guy right here. He looks like a little bear. He's only about uh, a, a millimeter long. Okay. Uh, let's say uh, no more than uh, half of a tenth of an inch. Okay. Fine. All right. Uh, wait a minute. They're called tardigraves. How do they survive? They can survive radiation doses 250 times what would kill any one of us. Radiation doses. Can, yeah, it can go, uh, it can take freezing temperatures at a minus 450 degrees Fahrenheit. Do you realize that's getting awfully close to absolute zero? Whoa. Take heat, 304 degrees Fahrenheit. That's, that's enough to cook your chicken. <laughs> All right. Extreme pressure and electron bombardment. All of them. They can... Uh, withstand okay it's just amazing the little thing called tardigrades and uh how did they ever evolve how did they get there in the first place because god populates the niches every one of them okay that's what i like about it and, and say well that's simplistic yeah it is <laughs> that, that fits me okay now you look at some of those thermo uh, file strands and you say wow some of those thermophiles like right here this is at the Grand Prismatic uh, area some of them are as thick as lasagna that's a nice mat of uh, microorganisms isn't it and it turns out that the top layer provides photosynthesis the bottom layer takes care of the waste products and gets them out of there so they're living in community. And isn't that what we're supposed to be doing as Christians? Living in community, helping each other, right? Each of us has been given certain giftings to use for the betterment of the body of Christ. And that's what we see right there. All right, so we're looking at creation and design, aren't we? 
All right. And uh, that is design. And I would say God fills every niche of his creation. And so you wonder why? That's it. Uh, we have to give God the credit for that one. You know, Yellowstone biology is extremely diverse, okay? And uh, flowering plants are 1,150 native species. We think, wow, that's a lot. It is. It really is. Except when you go to Costa Rica, uh, Alvin's been there with us. You know, there's 1,400 species of orchids alone. Think about all of the various flowers and plants of Costa Rica in that little country. It's so neat. Um, there are, are various type of conifers, uh, et cetera, and all kinds of stuff. It's really diverse. Uh, here are some of the flowers of Yellowstone right there. Some of them are very beautiful, but invasive or noxious. Okay, thistles. Even today, we call thorns and thistles invasive and noxious. That's what it was in Adam's day, wasn't it? Adam and Eve's day. Okay, pretty but noxious. All right, here's some of the other pools right here. Morning glory pool. And what you see is the center, at least 180 degrees, and the yellow, that's 145 degrees roughly. Pretty warm. Gorgeous pool, some of my favorite to look in there. And all the colors, remember, are mats of microbes. So we have quite a variety in the ecosystem in Yellowstone, just on the microorganism scale. All right, now <clears throat> we have uh, evergreens of Yellowstone, uh, lodgepole pine, Douglas fir, Engelmann spruce, and aspen. Did I get anybody going, huh? How, would you ever think aspen is an evergreen? It is. All right. Quake and aspens. You have birch up here, which are very similar. We have the quake and aspen in Colorado. You find them up in Yellowstone. But beneath the thin white outer bark, guess what, is a thin green photosynthetic layer that allows the tree to create sugars and grow when other deciduous trees would otherwise be dormant. All right, they grow, they grow all the time, even in winter, okay? But during hard winters, the green sugary layer uh, provides a lot of nutrients for elk and deer. And that God God's thinks about it, doesn't he? He cares about his creation, et cetera. And, uh, uh, but one thing else about that design, he has made the elk somehow aware that you don't want to eat the bark all the way around the tree. They only eat one third of the bark around the tree. That's it. That's all they do. So that quick and aspen will continue to thrive. Figure that one out. Of course, with all the trees, et cetera, eh, get fire there occasionally, don't you? And in 1988, the fires of Yellowstone destroyed one third of the forests in the park. We're talking about 100 uh, or 3,500 square miles in Yellowstone, right? That's a lot of square miles of forest. And when you look at it, you see, wait a minute, hold on. Look at, look at that. You see the old dead trees, right? But look at all that new growth. Wonderful. And even since the 2016 fire in Yellowstone, we have beautiful looking Christmas trees that I covet. I'm a, I'm a Christmas tree hunter, okay? And I go out every year and bag our Christmas tree. <laughs> I do. But when you go to those forests, ah, oh, I see the perfect Christmas tree. Every corner of the road, I see it. And so, uh, hmm, it'd be a lot easier than looking for the ones I do. But how do they grow? How do they get to be such a lush, vibrant forest and it's only a couple years, perhaps, since the fire. Wow, how does that work? Well, turns out lodgepole pines have two different type of 
pine cones. And this is true not just with lodgepoles, but of other pines as well. They have the normal one that uh, every year it grows, opens up, lets the seeds come down, etc. Okay. But they also have what's called a serotonous cone. And that is a cone that even you might have one that has regular cones. Here's another one with this type of cone. But a serotonous cone has a waxy coating on it. And that keeps that cone in and it does not open to spread the uh, seeds until, until a forest fire. The temperature gets from 100, and, I think 113 to 140 degrees. And all of a sudden now that melts the wax with a little bit of moisture now, cones open, the gravity and also the wind carry the seeds. And that rejuvenates the forest because those seeds really do well in the new burned forest floor. It's, it's amazing what God did with that particular design. And I say it's design. I say God knew what he was doing. And he does that through trees throughout the West. Okay? It's amazing. The lodgepole in the Yellowstone is nice and tall. You can see how you would use lodgepoles for uh, timbers, right? For your house. Uh, you go out to Pacific North. Whoops, there it is. Pacific Northwest. And guess what? <laughs> They're twisted. It's a different environment. They grow differently. It's the same tree. Okay. It's kind of like your environment makes a difference on how you flourish. Okay. It really seems to be the case there on the lodgepole. Yeah, we have amphibians there, uh, four species. There's four, uh, seven species of uh, reptiles. That's not nearly as many as the other things, right? And how about the fish? You've got beautiful fish, brown trout. Well, what's native is that one like at Yellowstone Lake is Yellowstone cutthroat trout. It's in the middle of it. it used to be you could just reel those thing in by the hundreds. The problem is a lot of people did. And the population went down, okay? Population did go down as a result. And then they introduced what they thought would be a really good game fish to put into Yellowstone Lake. Now, Yellowstone Lake is a big lake in Yellowstone National Park. It is 136 square miles. That's a big lake. It's a big, the, the uh, biggest freshwater body over 7,000 feet in elevation. Okay. All right. So they said, ah, oh, somebody got the crazy idea of introducing lake trout. Lake trout get to be really big. They like to catch big fish, right? But it turns out lake trout likes to eat Yellowstone cutthroat. And that really changed the balance. Today, if you fish in Yellowstone Lake, every cutthroat trout you catch, you have to throw back. But if you catch a lake trout, it is illegal to throw him back. <laughs> Okay, it is. It's illegal. <laughs> uh, now, we're going to get back to that about the um, lack of uh, Yellowstone cutthroat compared to what it was in the past. Okay, we have birds as well in uh, Yellowstone, lots of different types, 280 species. Uh, the trumpeter swan is one of my favorite. Oh, it's so photogenic. <laughs> I love taking pictures of them. Uh, but the trumpeter swan um, has an eight-foot wingspan. An eight-foot wingspan. And uh, it can fly 60 miles per hour. It's pretty fast. It's not the fastest bird, but it really moves. And uh, I really enjoy watching these things. They're great. We see them occasionally. Uh, we also have a sandhill crane. Okay, in the Yellowstone National Park. And you wonder how did they develop their migrational instincts? They go so far, so far. How did they figure that one out? All right. In Yellowstone, not only do you have uh, birds that are migrating, but you also have um, moths that migrate. Did you know moths migrate? 
They do. What about the monarch butterfly? The monarch goes, you probably heard that one, goes all the way from Canada, clear down into Mexico and takes them uh, what, two generations to get there and one generation to get back. And so the last generation never saw the route before. But God gives them directions. Okay, here's where you're going to go. Uh, but sandhill grains are much the same. Ravens are extremely smart birds. They'll actually take care of each other, right? And if one bird does something nice to it, one of the ravens, he might take a nice little shiny trinket and bring it to its mate. Say thank you, right? It's like the flowers on a birthday, right? <laughs> All right. And they do that. And in fact, there were some people that did something nice for a raven, and the raven flew off, came back, and dropped a real shiny little trinket, some kind of a necklace or something in front of the front of them. All right. They're, they're smart birds, okay? And they talk. Did you know that? Well, they talk among themselves <laughs> but you hear them it's rah, 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 you know, really noisy uh, uh, but uh, it's interesting yes they talk but I make sure you never quote the raven and what they say yeah there was a book or a story by Edgar Allan Poe quote the raven nevermore <laughs> anyhow some of you missed that <clears throat> Okay, osprey, two claws in the front, two in the back, and it actually has such tremendous eyesight, like the uh, like a bald eagle that can see five to six times better than you. Okay, it's so much faster, it can actually spot a fish in the lake from a mile away. Same thing with the osprey; it could actually go down, and you can see it. Now it's flying maybe 30, 40 miles per hour, and you say, that is a fast bird. Might even get up to 60. But then when it dives, it can go over 100 to 140 miles per hour. Boom, and it's dive, come up with a fish, and off it goes. Amazing design on how that works. Okay, kill deer. This is at Mammoth Hot Springs. Uh, unfortunately, this is uh, greener water. It's brownish, so it's not as hot as some of the other ones, right? Otherwise, it would fry its pinkies, okay? <laughs> All right, now, everybody who goes to Yellowstone want to see a bear, correct? Yeah, they want to see the bear. They used to see them all over because they would feed the bears. That's not so good. And in fact, they even had, uh, you might say, bleachers set up to view the bears at the dump. Then they decided that wasn't a good policy. Okay. And so the bears had to forge for themselves. All right. And so, uh, hmm. So, what's the best way to avoid being attacked by a, a grizzly? Take somebody hiking in the backcountry who can't run as fast as you. <laughs> okay. <laughs> that, that might work. Huh? They're big bears, okay? There they are. And uh, there's my grandson over here. Nice bear. Nice bear, right? <laughs> Fortunately, that is a uh, statue of one. If, if you go to Yellowstone National Park and you uh, <laughs> are desperate to see a bear, if you're really desperate to see a grizzly, go in the backcountry, go camping, and bring your half-eaten hamburger and keep it in your tent and open a can of tuna as well. You probably see a bear. <laughs> it's not the way you want to see a bear. <laughs> All right. Anyhow. It turns out there's only eight people that have died of bear attacks, of grizzly bear attacks, in Yellowstone since the park opened prior to 1900. So a lot of people really fear those grizzly bears, don't they? It's interesting. It's a good thing that tourists are not the primary diet of grizzly bears. <laughs> All right? They're not. 
Uh, in fact, fires uh, took a lot of the forest, of the grizzly bear habitat, and also took out the white bark pines. Guess what? Pine nuts was a very important part of the grizzly bear diet. Now, it didn't go out and pick up the pine cones, okay? What it would do is listen intently. Aha, here's a squirrel. Here's the squirrel, goes over. The squirrel's gonna chatter at him, right? Now he knows exactly where the cache is of the squirrel. Winter supply of pine nuts and he raids it, all right? Not a dumb bear, all right? So, but the forest uh, fires knocked out a bunch of it and then they migrated partly out of the park down into Idaho and uh, further down into Wyoming, etc. Now, <laughs> I used to hunt petrified wood at um, Wiggins Fork in uh, Idaho, uh, out of Dubois, Wyoming. You don't want to go there today because that is so bear infested with grizzlies right now, okay? Yeah, I, uh, I might want to go in there, and Mary Jo and I, when we were first uh, uh, with each other, basically what happened, we went all the way down into the Dubois. We packed way up into that wilderness area. And I carried 80 pounds of petrified wood out of my back. All right, I was quite a rock hound. But uh, today, uh -uh, you wouldn't want to go there yet. Uh, but anyhow, that's what the forest fires did. Now. What else do those grizzly bear eat? You would think lots of meat, true, lots of meat. And it will take down a cow elk, calf elk. It'll take down other animals. But uh, if it really wants to put on the weight, it wants a high caloric diet before hibernation. One of its favorite things to do would be dig for wild yams. Okay, wild, they're, they're digging. Big claws, what are they for? Scratching people, right? Fighting. No, digging out yams, okay? Or turning over rocks because another big source of their diet happens to be moths. Who would ever think that? This ferocious creature eats a lot of moths, up to 40,000. I've heard estimates in other papers, 60,000 moths per day. It uses those powerful arms and legs to be able to turn over rocks that moths have gone underneath. And before they get away, he just scoops them up. All right, that's what the moths do. And that's right out of the Smithsonian Magazine that you can uh, read about that you want to do that. But we never thought that, right? And um, hmm. so anyhow, the other factors, the cutthroat, trout, they used to spawn like crazy up the river and these bears would gorge themselves on those uh, trout. But with the fact that they don't have the trout as much, then they look for other sources of food and the moths were a good one, all right? It turns out that um, where they are in Yellowstone happens to be on the migration route. I said they migrate. The migration moth uh, of, the, uh, of the Miller moth, okay? It's called the Miller moth. It's right on that thing. God supplies for his beasts. Uh, yeah, manna in the wilderness, right, for the Israelites. Yeah, and uh, Mary Jo thinks we ought to stock up on some uh, lentils. And I go, ooh. <laughs> Probably what the Israelites did after most of the year uh, feasting on manna, correct? And, you know. Well, the wolves made a big impact when they were reintroduced into Yellowstone in 1995. But remember, they were there before. They are there. They actually helped control the environment, the wolves. Everybody doesn't like wolves, right? Uh, you don't want to be <clears throat> hiking with them, right? Okay, but they were reintroduced in 19, uh, 
95. It's put a lot of pressure on elk calves. 90% of the grizz of the grizzly bear's diet of meat is elk. Okay, 90% of it. And no, I'm sorry, 90% of the wolf diet is elk. I should say that of the wolf diet, not the grizzly bears. And I remember taking pictures of a group of wolves surrounding a big bull elk. They'll take down an elk, a big one too, occasionally. But um, in 2012, the population was 79. 2021, about 120 wolves. Okay? And they can get 150 to 170 pounds. They're a good sized dog. Okay? Now, since coyotes were introduced, excuse me, wolves were introduced, we noticed the coyote population suddenly went way down. And that was occupying the same habitat, but they're a lot smaller animal and probably not quite as shrewd. Good old wily coyote is probably not as shrewd as the big old wolves. Okay, but anyhow, but one interesting thing is the beaver population since they introduced wolves is going up. Why? Well, because the wolves put the pressure on the elk. The elk no longer stay in the same meadows. They move and migrate around. And that means they're not eating as many of the willows. Now there's more habitat for the beavers to proliferate. It's interesting, the balance of nature, isn't it? Yeah. Yep. God set it up. Other things you might see at the Yellowstone would be a mountain goat. And the pads on their feet, there are special non-slip pads well designed where you can climb. You can just hold on to a little tiny ledge, one inch or two inches. Same thing with the bighorn sheep, okay? It's amazing. Oh, by the way, if you have a battle between a grizzly and a, a mountain goat, who's going to win? You would think the grizzly. <laughs> uh, they just found a uh, grizzly bear that was dead, gored, gored to death by a mountain goat. I don't know how the mountain goat fared in the battle. They didn't say. But bighorn sheep are rather uh, interesting, too. You, you know, you, you can hear them banging heads together over a mile away. And boom! They just stand up on charge each other. Bam! Well, they have good shock absorbers and a very good skull system, too. And they have something that actually surrounds their brain. So it's kind of uh, floats. And so that put that uh, bighorn sheep will not get a concussion. You tried it one time and you're dead. <laughs> okay. From the force that they uh, do that. You know, you've got the antlers of a moose as well. And a lot of people say, oh, that's for fighting. Could be, you know, but it also used for scooping up bottom of a pond for some of its favorite food. Okay. A, a moose can go underwater for about 15 minutes. You wouldn't think that, would you? They can. Uh, the bull elk are fun to watch too. Uh, the bull elk will probably be more dangerous for you visiting uh, Yellowstone than grizzly bears, okay? And uh, people try to get too close. They don't try to get close to a grizzly bear, okay? But they might try to get up close because they look so calm until they stand up and, uh, what are you doing in my territory? And then watch out, okay? So the elk, you know, they poor elk, we drove them out of their habitat. Not really. They like what we did to their habitat, okay? Uh, that particular bull elk that you see right there, I, I, it actually charged somebody that was on the board route, board uh, walk there. And I didn't get to see uh, everything because of that tree just to the right, okay? And I would like to have gotten other pictures, but Bull elk are more dangerous than grizzly bear, but very few people have a problem with them because you you don't get really close to those animals. You don't want to get close to the American bison 
People think, oh, it's just walking along. But the, the bison can actually move 35 miles per hour. All right? 35 miles per hour. Uh, and that they can go from zero to 35 just like that. Mm -hmm. And uh, there are more people injured from bison than any other animal probably in the, well, no, except for one thing, squirrels. They try to feed the squirrels, even though all the science says don't feed the squirrels. No, they're not a deathly blow, but they sure have some good blood flowing, okay, in their hands. But American bison has done really well in parts of Yellowstone, for sure. So you see great big herds all the way into the background. You see bison there, don't you? But the National Park kind of warns you about that. It says, uh, if you want to pet a bison, yeah. <laughs> Think again, if you pet up here, if you, uh, uh, if you pet there on that shoulder, your vacation is over. <laughs> and if you tried to do the bottom of the leg or there, they say, do you have insurance paid up? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> These are wild animals. Any wild animals in a national park can be dangerous, okay? But I would still feel safer walking across Yellowstone, then I say I would feel safe walking across the city of Minneapolis. Okay, <laughs> do you understand? The pronghorn, people call them antelope, yeah, but it's it, technically it's a pronghorn, okay? And we see those things and they're fun to watch, okay? They run extremely fast. And the only thing that can run faster than an antelope, say, is a uh, cheetah. <laughs> All right, uh, beautiful falls. If you wanna see falls, go to Yellowstone. There are 280 falls you can go look at, okay? Uh, Gibbon Falls, one of the, one of the prettiest ones, and, uh, but it's not as big as some of the other ones. And at Gibbon Falls, you also see all kinds of glacial debris. That's gonna be important to think about because we're gonna put this glaciation into the uh, timeline, aren't we? When did that occur? Okay, I just want to let you know that there is evidence for a flood in uh, Yellowstone. Part of that is when we go to the Grand Tetons, you look at the top of Moran Peak. You see that black, um, it's called a dike. It's going to the black uh, material going up through there. Just to your right at the very top is the little sandstone layer. It's fairly thick, but it's, from this distance, it looks like a, a small one, but you go a little closer, you see a sandstone layer up there. Uh, that is the flathead sandstone. Flathead, flathead sandstone is really important because at the Tetons, that, that is at about a 6,000 foot above the valley floor, okay? But the problem is, there was a big fault in the Tetons. The Tetons, mountains rose up, valley sank down, right? Do you know how much displacement is there? You have to drill 20,000 feet down in the valley to come to the same top, uh, flathead sandstone. That's 26,000 feet of displacement over five miles. That's a lot, right? A lot of displacement there. But what's important about that flathead sandstone, it is the same pancake layer, the same pore as what you find at the, in Yellowstone. It is called, uh, uh, um, a, by a different name in Yellowstone, okay? Um, uh, I just forgot that name. I was about ready to say it, and all of a sudden, boop, that way it went, okay? <clears throat> Uh, but anyhow, it's the same sandstone that's under Yellowstone. So you see it in several different spots in Yellowstone if you knew where to look. All right. So, but the thing is, this is an interesting sandstone. Um, uh, it might be called D Deadhead in Yellowstone. I got that name. <laughs> or it's called Flathead in, uh, in uh, Grand Tetons. Same layer. Same layer, but at the Grand Canyon, it's called the Tapit Sandstone. The Tapit Sandstone, you notice the evidence of catastrophe there? 
big blocks of rock that it was carried. That was not a wind deposit, okay? It wasn't. But you go around, you see the top eight sandstone by different names in different parts of the country, but it correlates. That's because most geologists are working locally. So they have a local name for it. They're not working regionally or continentally. All right, but it's the top eight sandstone is the same one. And uh, I say it fits with the worldwide flood. And the part of the reason is the distribution of that top heat sandstone by many different names, but the same layer goes all the way from down into Mexico, all the way north of Greenland. We're talking about a flood deposit that's a big pancake, you might say, a, a layer of a sandstone, a big one, right? Transcontinental. That's what you're looking at. That's evidence of major flood when you see that, okay? And then there's limestones. Uh, the Manitou limestones is in Cal uh, Colorado, but you also have the Madison, Wyoming, also in Colorado, but also at Yellowstone National Park, the Madison. But the Glorietta limestone in New Mexico, the limestone layers in Indiana, guess what? is exactly the same pancake or the same pour as you have the red wall limestone in the Grand Canyon. So you have massive limestones across the world as well. Are you with me? What does that tell me? We have a worldwide flood. You also have the Niobrara Formation that goes all the way from Colorado across to the, or all the way to the Atlantic Ocean, but it doesn't stop there. It goes all the way, becomes the White Cliffs of Dover, same pancake, down into Israel, Spain, et cetera. I've heard now it's in Australia. I haven't been able to check it out, okay? Same formation, big pancakes, worldwide flood. Okay, so you have that big worldwide flood. Now, after the flood, after the flood, keep in mind, we have these huge volcanoes, right? Much of the volcano is volcanic activities going on under the ocean. That means it's gonna heat up the ocean quite a bit, isn't it? A lot of ocean, the oceans are gonna be a lot warmer right after the flood than they are today, because now we have the temperatures going down. But before the temperature went down, you have huge blankets of uh, hot air masses coming across that hot water, I can say hot, dumping lots of moisture over the continents. Pretty soon that moisture turns to snow, wet snow, perfect conditions for a uh, glacial ice. And it goes, gets up to about 4,000 feet deep at Yellowstone National Park. That's a lot of ice. <clears throat> then pretty soon, what happens? The glaciers begin to melt back when the temperature of the ocean begins to go down. Okay? Now we don't have as much differential. Now the glaciers go back. Dr. Michael Ord has uh, done calculations as a meteorologist. And he said, you can get the entire advance and retreat of the ice for the ice age in only 500 years. That's all it takes, not tens of thousands of years. Now, as all this is melting, you're going to have great big lakes. You're going to have glacial ice dams blocking rivers. And they're going to have great big inland seas coming behind it. And then they overtop their natural barriers. Well, first of all, ice is not a good thing to make a dam on a big river. Ice is not. And it finally breaks through and you get a huge flood of water going downstream, getting in the Pacific Northwest dry falls. That's what used to be a site of a major waterfall. That water would have been from horizon to horizon, hundreds of feet deep coming across that way, traveling at least 65 uh, maybe 75 miles per hour. And within 24 to 48 hours, you have huge canyons formed. See, canyons don't take long to form. The flood, the aftermath of the flood, right? The glaciation being one of them, all of this fits together into one model that really works well. And that's the Missoula flood that I'm talking about. Now you have the Bonneville flood, another one. Similar type of thing. Finally, a huge... Uh, pile of water 
collapses, comes downstream, forms that canyon within another few days. That's all. That's all it takes. Uh, again, uh, we're looking at that. I have a flood lecture that I'll be doing Friday night at the university, okay? At the University of Minnesota. I'll be uh, speaking there. I'll give you that uh, schedule uh, here at the end of this program here. Uh, so you can do the same thing with the uh, Grand Canyon and possibly in weeks, you can get the entire canyon cut, cut out with this type of scenario. Yellowstone Lake, keep in mind how big that lake is. It's 136 square miles. That's a big lake, isn't it? Major lake. Well, except for one thing. At one time in the past, it would have been 237 feet deeper than what it is today. That's what the evidence indicates. Where did that water go? Remember the canyon formation when suddenly all the water gets discharged? It goes downstream. And when it does, it carves through the deposits. Now keep in mind what you're looking at are volcanic rhyolite deposits from the Yellowstone volcanoes. Okay, you with me? Now, so we have to have the volcanism before we get any erosion, correct? Okay, so you see a big erosion. So Yellowstone Lake must have formed as uh, maybe glaciers were melting. And then overtopping, that had to have been the last thing that happened to carve our, this particular canyon. Okay, so that's what we see right there. So keep that one in mind. We're going to get back to it. In Yellowstone, you also can climb up Specimen Ridge. That's the one in the background. And... Uh, <clears throat> What's so, why do I even bring this up? Well, because this has knocked a lot of students out of the saddle in their faith because they've been taught it takes millions of years to form these petrified, upright, standing trees, Specimen Ridge, Yellowstone National Park. And there you do, you see one tree that's petrified. I don't mean scared, I mean turned into rock. All right, standing right next to a growing tree. And there used to be a signpost there at Yellowstone showing a cross section of the mountain. And basically they showed you multiple layers in this section, 27 layers of different trees. And then in layer after layer after layer. Now, the story was told that these trees look, lived in a forest. Then they were wiped out by a volcanic eruption, burying a lot of them, laying down, but some of them upright. All right, thousands of years later, guess what? Another forest grew in place of the first one, but it too was wiped out by another volcanic eruption, giving you a second layer, preserving some trees standing up. This then repeated itself 27 different times at Specimen Ridge. Okay, I said, pretty unlucky fire forests, right? Very unlucky. All right, that was what the signpost. And then we have people like uh, Ronald Numbers, who basically grew up in a church uh, home. And then he says, I remember vividly the evening I attended an illustrated lecture on the famous sequence of fossil forest, Specimen Ridge, Yellowstone National Park. And then stayed up much of the night with a biologist friend of like mind, first agonizing over, and then finally accepting the disturbing likelihood that the earth was at least 30,000 years old. See, he was taught it was 5,000, maybe 6,000. But 30,000 was a big stretch, just minimum. And of course, they didn't stop there. They would say millions of years. Okay, that's what they would. Wow. Then he said this, I, thus, having, dis, uh, having decided to follow science rather than scripture on the subject of origins, I quickly, though not painlessly, slid down the proverbial slippery slope toward unbelief. As far as I know, Ronald Numbers perished before he, without knowing, 
of the truth about what was going on there. What Dr. What Ronald Number should have done was stop. Yeah, that's an acronym I use. Basically, stand firm on the word of God. Uh, trust the Lord, even though you don't have the answers, okay? Observe options, our ways of explaining it, and do a lot of praying. That's stop. That's my stop method that I recommend to people. Now, you probably should pray first, but that's pots, not stop. And I, I like stop. Okay. That very year, Ronald Dumber was publishing his book. Okay. Very year. I was at Yellowstone National Park, 1992, I think. And I was uh, doing some research with a few other guys on the famous Specimen Ridge. And you know what I found? Below those trees, the roots were abruptly broken off. They're not there. Trees don't do well without roots. There are no soil horizons from one layer to the next. Trees don't do well without soil. And then I was doing some other library research, finding out that the tree ring structure, the pattern was identical from one layer to the next to the next in many of those layers. What does that tell you? They lived at the same time. That very same year, I asked the geologist there and a ranger at Yellowstone, where is the signpost? I, my picture was a little blurry and I want a new one, okay? Where is the signpost that, we, that you used to have here at Yellowstone? He said, we took it down. Why? He says, because the the events that happened at Mount St. Helens most closely resemble what we have here at Yellowstone Park and what we used to teach. Okay, that's what he said. Now there's a new signpost about equating Yellowstone and what happened at, the, at uh, Mount St. Helens. Isn't that neat? Science changes. We should stop, stand firm on the word of God. Don't just take something, you know, because that's what the current view of science, what knocked Ronald Number out of his faith was not the science, it was an interpretation of the science. All right. Now, today, the Yellowstone River, Hayden Valley, beautiful spot, a lot of wildlife. But keep in mind, that would have been underwater at the time of the collapse of the uh, uh, Yellowstone Lake. Okay. Now, the biggest question right now we get frequently is Yellowstone going to blow again? If I go on that tour, is it going to blow? <laughs> okay, good question. Well, keep in mind, the hot spot is still there. Okay, it's still there. That's what gives us our hydrothermal uh, features. In 1959, no, not August 31st, that was August 18th. Okay. So scratch that number. It's August 18, 1959. All of a sudden, in the middle of the night, there was a huge landslide up on here. And that's called the earthquake of 1959. And the major side of that mountain collapsed right down into the Madison River. And when it did, it blocked the river, made what's called now Earthquake Lake. People at that time, probably thought Yellowstone was blowing. And in fact, things were shaken. Even this was into uh, uh, 35 miles away where the epicenter was, but even in Yellowstone, things were being shaken tremendously, okay? And the lodge, they thought, I think it's blowing. No, it was an earthquake. It was an earthquake and that happens. This was a big one though. Uh, it's be around seven on the Richter scale the biggest one in that whole area. So will it blow? According to Tim Clary, um, unlikely to blow, and there's a reason for, and we see that the super eruptions are declining around the world, all right? Um, okay, so it seems that the Yellowstone hotspot, hotspot has experienced a three-fold decrease in capacity to produce super volcanic eruptions. Okay? This is a very significant decline. Quote from a, um, Tim Clary through uh, researchers Thomas Knott. All right. 
All right, now, so I had talked about the fact that um, this little uh, Mount St. Helens blast was little compared to what happened in the past at Yellowstone. We've got a 10,000 times, 4,000 right here, but the other big one too, that's 10,000 times bigger than uh, Mount St. Helens. We also look at lava flows around the world. Uh, basically, the biggest one we've seen in fairly recent times happens to be 218 square miles in Iceland. But think about some of those in the Pacific Northwest. We have in the Columbia basalts, et cetera, et cetera Pacific Northwest, 30,000 square miles. That's big. That's a lot of lava flow. You go to India, the Cowan Plateau, you have 100,000 square mile volcanic flows. Wow. Keep in mind that the scripture says he touched the mountains and they smoke. So to sum it up, the last, where are those events? Where's the volcanism? Where's the glaciation, et cetera? Well, first of all, we've already mentioned that that canyon carving had to be probably the last, okay? And the reason is, look at, at what a bulldozer does go, of an ice sheet going through a valley. Notice how it, uh, I'm going to go back that one. Notice how it carves out this big U-shaped valley, valley. Ice is like a bulldozer, okay? The one you see in, down here on your right is uh, Yellowstone Canyon. Okay, that is the big canyon there. Grand Canyon of Yellowstone, they call it. It's V-shaped. So it was after the ice. So we got that piece in place. Okay, now we also see that the ice moved volcanic rock. Lots of it. So the ice age had to be after the volcanism at Yellowstone National Park. So far, so good. Now, when did the volcanism occur? Some have suggested it was right at the tail end of the flood, others just after. We can't say 100%. Michael Ord would say it was before the flood. Tim Clary and some of the others at ICR, or not before the flood, it would be uh, before the end of the flood. And Clary would say just after the flood. Okay? And so it... The creations don't know exactly, but look at that time between flood and the Tower of Babel, probably somewhere in there. All right. And uh, so that would be the timeline that we're looking at. So we are studying the world today, aren't we? We're looking at trying to figure out the origin of life. And, uh, we see design, we see the fall, we see flood, etc. It turns out even that, that Yellowstone, God's word, God's world, agree. That's what I like about that. And so um, thanks to the National Park for some of the photos, and I've taken a whole bunch of them as well, Wikipedia. Um, coming up tomorrow night at the college here, at the university, uh, we're going to talk about blind chance and grand design. And also uh, Thursday, so-called proofs of evolution fail. Was Darwin wrong? And then Friday, lots of time or lots of water, archaeological or geologic evidence there really was a flood. Those are the three topics I'll be doing over the next three nights, University of Minnesota. So visit our website. God bless you. What a wonderful chance to be with you. All right. Thank you. Yes, and Mary Jo is going to come up here too, uh, just because she is good at uh, better at hearing than I am. Ever since my accident in 2017, let, let me add here that they are used to dealing with hostile audiences. So somebody better ask a hard question, or at least growl or something. Okay, growl like a grizzly bear. What's your feelings of global warming? Um, you know, there used to be a group in Minnesota about global warming. What's my feeling about it? There used to be a group at the University of Minnesota that was actually called Minnesotans for Global Warming. 
uh, I believe that there is uh, cycles. There are cycles. Um, global warming, yes. Man caused, no, not likely. Okay, have we contributed to a little bit? Just an iota, but it's not the cause of any of the warming. They had a warmer uh, earth, etc. even in the medieval ages. There's evidence for that, okay? So there's more things too. If you want a good resource on that, go ahead, Mary Jo. Without cars. <laughs> yeah, without cars. Go ahead, tell us. Uh, uh, by the way, there's cornwallalliance.org if you want to know about global warming, that whole stuff. He is a real researcher and uh, I think some of the best materials there. He's actually testified in front of the uh, Senate before or the House. Okay. <laughs> If that might be the last person somebody agrees with me in the next three days. <laughs> Way back there, go ahead. Yeah. Those uh, serotonous cones. Yes. Do the seeds produce only trees that have serotonous cones? Do they? He's wondering if they produce only trees that have serotonous No, no, they don't. Uh, when you look at the forest that you see today, guess what? There's a mixture all the way through there. So uh, some of them will be serotonous, so many will be uh, regular cones too. All right. Is there a way to tell if like a volcano that happened in the past, whether it was happened underwater or on land? Uh, yes, you can tell the difference between a volcanic lava flow, anyhow, whether it was underwater or on land. And it has to do with the type of basalt and the bubbles and the gases and how they are dissipated as they cool. And uh, so you have what's called pillow basalt that could be formed under underwater. And so we do see some of the... Uh, uh, Big ones of the Deccan Plateau in India, that's underwater. And that's going to heat up that water quite a bit to help toward uh, the um, eventually the ice age. Okay, So yes, you can. Now, when a volcanic eruption actually blows out, there are certain indicators. I don't necessarily think that we can pin it down if it was right near the end of the flood or uh, after the flood is totally over. I don't think we can quite tell from what I've been able to, to study. A lot of speculation on either side. But we do know it was right near the flood because of the, uh, uh, the land deposits, et cetera, that you see mixed in with some of the volcanics. Mm -hmm. Okay, way back there sitting on the floor. I was wondering, with uh, Craters of the Moon State Park or National Park there in Idaho near Yellowstone, yep. do you think um, that had anything to do with the Yellowstone lava or the, 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 the that explosion? Do you remember that? Um, uh, you do remember that uh, moving hotspot? Yes. So Craters of the Moon would have gone right, it would have gone right past that as sure. well. And so it probably is associated with the Yellowstone hotspot. All the way from Oregon, clear to its present position in Yellowstone. Yes. Are the thermophiles related or are they very different from each other? The, the, the four, the... But they're different organisms. They're different organisms living in the various bands. Are they bacteria? There can be microorganisms. Some of them are bacteria, but various microorganisms. Okay. It's uh, not, uh, they're not all bacterial. They're bacterial mats and other type of microbes. Okay. Beautiful. Oh yeah, and they are gorgeous. They really are. Okay, well, looks like uh, we better shut it off tonight. Thank you. Uh, don't, I want you to understand that the uh, creation group here has books over there Make sure you avail yourself of those valuable resources. And what, Mary Jo? If you want that Yellowstone guidebook, uh, you can get on our website and order that. And uh, 
We hope some of you will be able to come to Yellowstone with us next year. Or Costa Rica. <laughs>